Hello, welcome to um, the webinar on connecting youth experiencing homelessness to employment. We will get started in just a few minutes. We'll just wait as um, more people join the call and we'll get started in just a minute. Okay, I think we'll go ahead and get started. Um, thank you. Again, welcome to the webinar on connecting youth experiencing homelessness to employment, policy, programs, and practice. My name is Carrie Felton, and I am a graduate student intern for Heartland Alliance National Initiatives on Poverty and Economic Opportunity. I'll be facilitating today's webinar, um, and I'm also joined with some great speakers. So before we get started, um, I want to go over some housekeeping logistics. Um, and so first of all, everyone listening to the webinar is muted. You can use the chat box on the control panel on the side featured here to ask questions at any time. We have some time reserved at the end of the webinar to allow um, our presenters to respond to any of your questions, um, but feel free to go ahead and um, um, enter those at any time. Uh, just so you know, all the slides from today's webinar and the recording will be available on our website. Um, so don't worry if you missed a few things, you can go back and listen to it later or share it with folks. Um, and finally, for those of you on Twitter, we invite you to tweet along with us using the hashtag connecting youth. So hashtag connecting youth. Um, you should be able to see it at the bottom of our slides there. Um, so we can share with the Twitter sphere all of our great ideas. Um, so I'll go back to um, the slide with our presenters. Um, we are lucky to have some really great folks joining us on the webinar. Um, I'll be handing it off to them shortly so that they can share their experiences and insights around connecting youth experiencing homelessness with employment. Um, but first, I'll go ahead and share a little bit about who we are. Um, Heartland Alliance is a nearly 130-year-old human rights and social service organization headquartered in Chicago. And the Heartland Alliance National Initiatives team um, is dedicated to ending chronic unemployment and poverty. We work at the intersection of research, policy, and practice to affect change that is informed by evidence um, and grounded in the experiences of providers and advocates across the country. Uh, one of those national initiatives is the Center National Center on Employment and Homelessness or NCEH, if you like acronyms, uh, which it works to ensure the employment, works to ensure that employment and quality jobs is a key part of efforts to prevent and end homelessness. Um, so now- Hi, I'm Carrie, gonna... I'm really sorry. This is Katie, my, and for the audience, my slides will only go forward, so there is no- Oh, that's code. okay. <laughs> that's fine, that's uh, fine. Um, I'll go ahead and introduce our first speaker. Um, I'll just introduce our speakers as we go. Um, so first we have Mindy Mitchell from the National Alliance to End Homelessness. Um, and Mindy, I'll just let you take it away. Mindy, are you maybe on mute? I'm having trouble. 
hearing you. Okay, there we go. I was I muted myself in two places, and now I am unmuted in both places. Oh, wonderful! <laughs> hey. Now you can okay. take it away. <laughs> great. Um, thank you, and thanks again to Heartland Alliance for being such great partners um, with us in um, the movement to end all forms of homelessness, and for having me on the webinar today. Um, I'm just going to talk really briefly about something we maybe don't think about a lot in our conversations about homelessness, especially when we're focusing on practice level work and improving individual outcomes, which is super important. Um, but we should also be thinking about how all of this practice fits into actually ending youth homelessness. In other words, how does employment fit into the systemic response to youth homelessness? Next slide. Okay, so um, at its base, Homelessness is um, just a mismatch between someone's income and the cost of housing. This is true for young people too, but of course where youth are concerned, um, the role of family conflict, which may itself be exacerbated by that mismatch between income and housing, can't be understated. Um, we also have to consider the role of structural inequality at both the systems and program level and how those contribute to racial disparities among young people experiencing homelessness. Um, also for young people particularly, the child welfare and juvenile justice system them, themselves can be direct feeders into homelessness, but, um, next slide. Ultimately, that simple equation remains um, and bringing balance back between income and the cost of housing is what ends homelessness. So how do we make that happen on the income side of the equation? Um, with employment, most obviously, but even that has to be done from a systems approach to really solve the social problem of homelessness. Next slide. So one helpful way to think about that systemic approach is the clock store analogy. Um, for so many years, our approach to homelessness across the country has been programmatic and not systemic. Um, so that's like having a bunch of individual clocks in the clock store, all set to different times, um, some of them running fast, some of them running slow, everybody's got different alarms going off at all different hours. But with a systemic approach, um, that requires us all to come together and work together as different gears within a single clock. And we're all set to the same time and goal, which in this case is ending youth homelessness. And the workforce system is such a vital gear within that clock. And it's something that we don't talk about enough. Next slide. Um, indeed, as you'll see here, one of the system performance measures um, that communities are assessed on under the HEARTH Act, um, and this is for folks that receive HUD funding um, to end homelessness, is increasing jobs and income. Next slide. Um, now, I normally use this flowchart uh, primarily for dispelling myths about the HUD definition of homelessness, especially that couch surfing youth aren't defined as homeless. Um, indeed, as you can see, all of these categories are defined as homeless. It's just a matter of they're eligible for different things within the homelessness system. Um, but for today's purpose, what I want us to think about is this big piece at the bottom of the flowchart. There are so many other funding streams in our communities that we simply must be coordinating with to end youth homelessness. And the importance of the state and local workforce systems are one of the most impactful and underutilized pieces of that puzzle. Next slide. Again, as we often say about rapid rehousing, which by the way is a great housing first intervention for young people, um, housing first is not housing only. Services are vital for helping young people stabilize in and maintain housing. And one of the most important things that rapid rehousing case management should be doing is connecting young people to all the resources in the community that they're eligible for, especially, especially employment services. And Heartland Alliance, of course, has a ton of great resources about the most effective ways to do that, which you'll all be hearing a lot more about today. Next slide. 
Oh, look, and that's it for me. Um, thanks again, everybody, and uh, thanks for everyone at Heartland for inviting me to be a part of today's webinar. I'm super happy to connect with any of you via email to talk more about implementing systemic responses to youth homelessness after the webinar. And of course, I'll be around for questions. Awesome, great, thanks, Mindy. Um, like she said, if you have a question, um, just you can direct it to Mindy in the in the chat box, and I'll make sure it gets directed over to her. Thanks for um, some really good insights about systemic um, change. Next, we have Megan from Away Home America. Megan, uh, take it away. Hi there, everybody. My slides will have 100% fewer cat pictures than Mindy's will, um, but hope to uh, hope to give you some good content nonetheless. I'm here to do a little bit. Of, I, knew, I knew I knew that would get a laugh. Um, I'm here to do a little bit of stage setting on the national movement to end youth homelessness as we uh, turn to talk about employment and the role of employment in effectively ending youth homelessness. And I'm going to be brief with my comments because honestly, I am thrilled to be here and to learn from all of you and looking forward to the discussion. For folks that might be new to who Away Home America is, we are an initiative that is here to build the national movement to effectively end youth homelessness. And we are made up of philanthropists, researchers, national advocates, providers, young people who've experienced homelessness, all uniting behind this common goal. Next slide. Our values are that we partner with young people as equals in our movement and we promote racial justice and LGBT equity in all that we do. Um, I say that we practice those values because it's not that we arrive there uh, and have achieved them, but it's, it's work uh, values that we practice in all that we do. Especially when we're talking about employment today, what's the role of young people in identifying what they want and need and what's going to be sustainable for them? That's about partnering with young people as equals in this work. Next slide. It's, I think, easiest to talk about Away Home America, which is a big idea initiative by talking specifically about what we do. We divide our work into policy, practice, and communications areas. Uh, under policy, briefly, we utilize this collective voice that we have, all of those stakeholders across the country coming together behind this common goal to advocate uh, primarily for additional resources and sustaining the resources at the federal level that we know are necessary to further this work uh, on ending youth homelessness. Under practice, we've got a number of activities. You may have heard about 100-day challenges in Austin, Cleveland, and LA. We are currently launching 10 additional challenges. Five are underway. And a shout out to Hennepin County in just a moment for their focus on employment. And we have five more that are coming up next in rural areas. So um, do take a look at our Twitter and follow us for more news on those. The Away Home America Community Dashboard I'm going to touch on in just a moment because I think the folks on this webinar are interested in systemic responses to homelessness. You're thinking about um, both housing and employment, uh, and you may be thinking about how we actually track that progress at the system level. Um, across all of these efforts, Away Home America works to support the collective learning. So how can we understand what's working in Anchorage that might be useful in Omaha and ensure that we're learning that really in real time uh, as this work is underway? Across all of these efforts as well, part of Away Home America's function is to promote a real strategic framing of the issue. All of you on this webinar have a profound amount of knowledge uh, from the front lines on what is going to work to end youth homelessness and what you're seeing in the realities of young people every day. Away Home America works to package that, if you will, in a way that is strategic in this current Congress, this current administration, so that we can move forward together. Next slide. Mentioned a shout out to Hennepin County and their 100 Day Challenge. Um, Hennepin County has an, a specific employment focus on their 100 Day Challenge. So I mentioned their work on this webinar because they are a good community to follow as we start disseminating the lessons learned from those challenges. They're at about day 50 and they're working on both housing young people but also connecting young people to sustainable and meaningful employment as part of what's going to make that housing sustainable. Next slide. I also mentioned the 100 Day, uh, pardon me, the Away Home America Community Dashboard. Uh, there's a mock-up of that dashboard on your slide. I will admit that this is a terrible abuse of PowerPoint, but I show this mock-up to you uh, because you are folks on this call that are thinking about what a systemic response to youth homelessness looks like, what's the role of employment, um, how do we connect young people to housing in a way that is a sustained exit from homelessness. The Away Home America Community Dashboard is a project that's intending to create a picture of how the homelessness system is functioning 
for young people across multiple communities. Um, it allows us to trial real community-driven metrics for how we measure progress uh, on this issue of youth homelessness, and it also is a, a waypoint, if you will, towards the eventual criteria and benchmarks. So communities volunteer to participate in this dashboard project. If you would like information about that, uh, send me an email. I'd love to tell you more. It's one way that communities can demonstrate uh, both the gap between the need and the resources and their progress over time. Next slide. I want to share a couple, before I pass things off, a couple of promising themes that Away Home America is seeing with conversations in communities across the country relevant to employment. The first is we have a lot of knowledge about what might be developmentally appropriate. We've got a lot of knowledge on how we support youth and young adults in particular to meet their great life. And what we also know is that developmentally appropriate doesn't mean that one size fits all. So we don't assume that a young person will or will not be successful in a particular program just by virtue of their age. Um, the next lesson learned is centering LGBT youth and youth of color. What that means for us is that we look at programs such as employment programs look at their outcomes and see if they are as successful for young people of color and LGBT youth as they are for their peers. Um, those are the type of programs that we would want to scale up. And finally, meaningful youth collaboration is one of the promising themes. How can young people be involved in the development of employment programs in evaluating the success of these programs? And certainly, how can they be involved in setting their own career goals? Next and last slide, uh, would love to ask you to join us. That is our mailing list, Twitter, and Facebook, of course. More information on all of what I've just shared there, and I'm excited about diving into employment. Awesome. Thanks, Megan. Um, next, we have our very own Katie Schnur. Um, she's our policy advocate or at National Initiative. So go ahead, Katie. Thanks so much, Carrie, and thanks also to Mindy and Megan for giving that high-level overview of some of the work um, that's going on in the field as it relates to employment on the systemic level. Um, what I'm going to be talking about today is promising practices and principles for helping youth experiencing homelessness succeed in employment. Um, and I'm really drawing this presentation from my team's Opportunity Youth Employment Toolkit, uh, which I'll discuss a little bit more about what's in there on the next slide. Um, just so that we're all on the same page, speaking generally, the term opportunity youth includes young people 16 to 24 who have, um, are either not in school or working after the age of 16 or under attached to school and the labor market. Um, so they don't necessarily have a degree or stable attachment to work. Um, that being said, I would say that for this toolkit, we really wanted to focus on opportunity youth who face the most significant uh, barriers to employment including young people living in poverty, experiencing homelessness, and justice-involved youth, among others. To give you a sense of um, what we have in this toolkit, uh, the toolkit is made up of two research briefs. Uh, one is more on the practices and principles side. The other is about uh, leveraging public workforce dollars towards serving youth facing barriers to employment, as well as a number of case studies. Um, this toolkit is available for free on our website, and uh, we will direct folks to our toolkit um, before we close out the webinar today. So a little bit of background on how we got to this project. Um, our team is committed to evidence-based practice. For that reason, we began with a scan of the literature. And that taught us a lot about the different components of youth employment programs, but not necessarily how to implement them and really approach programming effectively. So following our literature review, we uh, conducted a series of in-depth interviews with the folks who really know this work the best, um, providers and practitioners in the field, including um, representatives from Daybreak Dayton and Brighton Dovers, who um, are both featured on today's webinar. Um, and I would say that of the practitioners we targeted, about half were specifically working uh, with youth experiencing homelessness. Uh, we synthesized, analyzed all that we learned, uh, ran it by researchers in the field to make sure that we weren't going too far afield in our recommendations, uh, and that is how we arrived at the content of our toolkit. So I will say that while some of the recommendations in our toolkit have not undergone rigorous evaluation uh, in the research context, uh, this toolkit really reflects what we're learning from the field about what's working. 
quickly wanted to say that one thing we really wanted to do uh, was kind of the central paper in our Opportunity Youth Employment Toolkit was to place employment at the center of the conversation around opportunity youth um, and youth experiencing homelessness. So as you can see from this slide, there are a number of positive ripple effects uh, that occur when young people can secure and succeed in employment. Um, and those ripple effects really touch young people themselves, their families, and society. Um, and all of these are discussed in further depth in our paper, but I think that when I think about employment as it relates to young people experiencing homelessness, um, it's really that point that employment can foster health and positive relationships. Uh, we know that caring and stable relationships with adults uh, can be really important and meaningful for youth experiencing homelessness. Uh, so this kind of benefit of employment really sticks out to me uh, in a way that connecting youth experiencing homelessness to the workforce can be particularly powerful. One thing um, that I'll also add is that we know that most housing interventions for young people are time limited. So whether that is a rapid rehousing subsidy or transitional housing, um, it is not necessarily the case that the majority of young people will be placed into permanent supportive housing or receive a housing subsidy um, over the course, course of their lifetime. So again, uh, getting youth experiencing homelessness on track to employment or post-secondary education is really critical to um, helping them secure longer term housing stability um, and pathways towards economic stability as well. So with all that being said, um, I want to jump in to the promising practices and guiding principles uh, for the design, implementation, and improvement of employment services uh, for young folks facing significant barriers to employment. Number one is really the importance of targeting and reaching the youth who can benefit the most. So the research shows us that the more intensive and expensive employment programming really works better for the young people who need those programs the most. So a young person who's going to have a better chance of succeeding in the workforce uh, on their own really isn't the best candidate for these intensive employment interventions that use the strategies that I'll discuss today. So to make best use of limited resources, employment programs really need to make deliberate efforts to recruit the youth who face the most significant barriers. And what that means is that it's critical to reach out to young people who don't seek services on their own. Uh, when you think about a young person who's experiencing homelessness, someone who is um, highly vulnerable, it's not necessarily realistic to expect that person to show up to employment services on their own. And actually one employment program that we've worked with tells us that any young person who does show up on their own actually is not a person that they're going to serve. They're going to refer them elsewhere because they're already further along in the process um, than what that program can offer them. So really similar to street outreach to engage homeless youth and housing services, a surge on persistent outreach is often necessary to bring youth into employment services. And this is the type of outreach uh, that can take weeks or even months and really involves that relationship building. Uh, it also means having strong referral relationships with the system to serve youth who are likely to be experiencing or at risk of homelessness, uh, including the foster care system and the justice system so that you can really get those targeted referrals. Number two is the importance of designing uh, program and engagement strategies to align with the realities of serving youth. Um, and this means engaging with young people for as long as it takes. So adult-oriented workforce development programs may engage with um, those adults for around three to nine months. But programs targeting young people facing really significant barriers um, often have engagement periods that can last for years. We spoke with one program um, that says young people will be in their programming for up to four or even more years. Uh, that doesn't mean that they are receiving necessarily employment services that entire time, um, but that the program remains a resource to them and can offer follow on uh, supports and services as needed. Um, and this really extended and flexible engagement period can facilitate a lot of the principles and practices that are highlighted in our paper. It's also about offering young people multiple chances to fail and try again. We know that the skills needed to be successful in work um, really take time to master, and we can't really expect a young person to get it all right the first time. 
So really successful youth employment programs recognize that young people are going to quote unquote mess up um, and they plan ahead for it and don't exclude those young people moving forward, um, but rather allow them to come back into services through structured pathways. Um, one program that we interviewed for this paper, which I'll discuss uh, in a little bit more depth in a few slides, runs a transitional jobs program and actually expects and plans uh, for youth to uh, not be successful in their transitional employment and to be fired. And they have structured pathways to bring people back into programming. It does not mean that they're being kicked out. Number three is about addressing the unique developmental needs of youth. Um, when discussing effective service delivery for uh, young people experiencing homelessness, multiple providers stress the importance of meeting youth where they are. Um, I realize completely that this can be a kind of social service buzzword, um, but what it meant in the context of our interviews was really recognizing and accepting a young person's current readiness and willingness to take steps towards positive change related to uh, employment goals. So employment isn't necessarily going to resonate with all young people right away. Um, and from a practice perspective, that can really mean having different employment related options for young people. Uh, by way of example, Larkin Street, which many of you may be familiar with, uh, is an organization that is based in San Francisco, serves youth experiencing homelessness and offers staged work experiences. So they have a transitional jobs program that offers an hourly wage for entry level work. Uh, it's low commitment, pretty much no barriers to entry. It's low skill level work. Um, but what it is, is a way to make money in a safe and stable environment and to begin to learn more about other programming that Work and Street um, might be able to offer. Um, but then for youth who are a little bit further along uh, in the process of connecting to employment, there are job readiness classes. Uh, those can lead to time limited paid job placements with local partners in the community, um, as well as access to vocational training and supportive services uh, in order to pursue higher wage work. On this slide, um, I also want to touch on this idea of applying therapeutic concepts to employment services. So many providers have actually taken therapeutic tools and have figured out how to apply them to employment effectively. And these tools can include cognitive behavioral therapy, motivational interviewing, understanding and facilitating the stages of change, and trauma-informed care. And I'm gonna to touch on those last two in the next few slides. Uh, what I do wanna add is that providers are using these tools uh, to help young people build confidence, support commitments to employment, uh, and teach workplace skills that are important, such as handling conflict, for example. Um, these therapeutic techniques are not necessarily being used in the clinical sense uh, to treat someone in a therapeutic setting, uh, but have rather been repurposed uh, to employment services in particular. I said I wanted to do a little bit of a deeper dive um, into change theory um, and then do a short case study on an organization um, that uses change theory really effectively as it designs programming. Uh, so the general idea behind change theory, as you can see, is that change is a process. It's not an overnight transformation. There are a number of different stages that people move and cycle through as they undertake making big changes like becoming engaged in the workforce for the first time. So for practitioners in the youth space, it's really important to be able to recognize uh, when a young person shows up for programming and starts to work towards those employment-related goals, where are they in the stages of change uh, so that you can meet them and kind of move forward from there. Uh, it's also important to realize that the process of change involves uh, relapse or that arrow up and down the side uh, that says recycling. Uh, which we kind of can understand as reverting back to old behaviors. So an example might be uh, showing up for work on time every day for a week and then just never showing up again. Um, and that is actually totally normal. It's a part of that change process. Um, and shouldn't actually be viewed as a negative or a deficit of a young person, but rather just a kind of manifestation of their undertaking a change process. Quickly wanted to talk about um, a program that we've worked with that's really done a great job using change theory to guide their services. 
Um, and that program is ROPA Inc., uh, which again is a transitional jobs program for high risk justice involved young men who are on track to adult incarceration. So ROCA's target population uh, is not explicitly youth experiencing homelessness, um, but these are definitely young people who are detached from the labor market, uh, living in poverty and highly advantage disadvantaged neighborhoods, um, and are very likely experiencing housing instability. So ROCA uses change theory in a few different ways. Uh, for one, they engage in really extensive outreach. So they're targeting folks who are in the pre-contemplation stage of change with regard to employment, meaning that those young people aren't really thinking about the value that employment might have uh, in their lives moving forward. So to bring young people into services, Roca engages in what they call uh, relentless outreach. So this long-term repeated outreach efforts that uh, include quite literally meeting people where they are via street outreach. Uh, like Larkin Street uh, that I mentioned earlier, ROCA also uses that stage-based programming approach. So a young person can come to ROCA to participate in one hour long class. They don't have to make any sort of commitments at that time. Um, or if they're kind of further along in their engagement and uh, efforts to attach to work, um, they can participate in a full course that might offer a certificate. So really being able to meet people where they are. Um, again, as I noted, ROCA applies that change theory concept to young people's transitional jobs experience uh, by expecting and planning for the fact that young people are going to, again, quote unquote, mess up, uh, get fired from their transitional job at least once and probably more than once, um, and have a process in place to make sure that young people understand what happened, um, to make changes, address barriers, and then get back into that work. Um, and this firing and reinstating approach is really informed by the idea that relapse is a part of that change process. Uh, finally, one thing that I just think is interesting is that ROCA is really open uh, with the young people that they work with that they're using as change theory framework. So they'll actually teach young people about the stages of change, discuss it, um, and help them understand their behaviors through this framework. Um, I also just wanted to make sure that I showed this slide, um, which I think is a really helpful explanation of the role that trauma can play in acting as a barrier to employment. Uh, we know that young people who have experienced or experienced homelessness um, or at risk of homelessness have um, also experienced trauma in their lives. Uh, this is a slide from our partners at the Midwest Harm Reduction Institute um, and really shows that trauma symptoms can manifest in different ways that might impact a young person's ability to be successful in employment right away. Um, so someone might be left feeling hopeless, struggling to set long-term goals, um, have a kind of angered response to a trigger that could happen in the workplace or in a training program. Um, and all of these trauma responses uh, can make it difficult to uh, jump into work successfully right away. Uh, for that reason, employment programs that are serving youth experiencing homelessness um, really need to take this kind of trauma-informed care approach, um, be able to recognize the different symptoms of trauma, respond in a way that's caring and supportive and seeks to not re-traumatize people, um, also helping young people be able to understand their trauma symptoms, identifying triggers that might happen on the job, um, and equipping young people to be able to manage uh, those trauma symptoms. Um, or equipping employer partners to recognize and be able to respond effectively to a young person's trauma-related behavior. Uh, we actually have an entire webinar that is focused on incorporating trauma-informed care into employment services, uh, which is for free available on our website. I realize I have gone over time in my presentation, um, so I'm just gonna gloss over these last few slides. Um, our one idea that we lift up uh, throughout this paper is the importance of offering paid employment opportunities for young people, um, rather than say only offering job training or work readiness preparation. Uh, income is a strong incentive to get young people engaged and to keep them engaged. Uh, it offers the opportunity to um, kind of learn how to work by working uh, in a, a setting that is offering that income that comes along with a job. Uh, we'll have two folks from different social enterprises talk more about their approach to offering paid work experiences to young people experiencing homelessness. 
Um, so the last thing that I will add here is that <clears throat> we also know that having paid work um, is a possibility to potentially become eligible for the earned income tax credit, uh, which can play a significant part in helping to uh, lift folks out of poverty. Uh, number five is about the importance of building trusting relationships. So a number of the programs that we spoke to told us that building caring and authentic relationships with youth is their staff's most important role, above and beyond actually securing a job for them. Uh, better relationships lead to better service. Um, again, because staff are able to identify what youth need, what they want, and again, where they're kind of at in that change process. Uh, so really one of our biggest takeaways from our interviews uh, is that when it comes to young people, it's about that person and about that relationship. Uh, another thing to just flag is that supportive relationships with a caring adult might not exist uh, in other parts of young people's lives. Um, it can take time to build, especially for young people who have experienced trauma or the loss of a significant relationship. Um, and this really circles around to the need for prolonged program engagement um, and, and the idea that these relationships can be one of the benefits of employment. Um, I think that both Bright Endeavors and Daybreak Dayton will have some kind of tangible ideas about how to foster trusting uh, relationships both among peers and among uh, peers or among participants and staff, um, which I know that they do in their own programming. Last thing I'll touch on is the importance of uh, educating employers. Uh, so when it comes to engaging employer partners, uh, programs really do need to focus on having a strength-based approach uh, that shows employers the value of hiring their program participants. Uh, but at the same time, employment programs need to make clear that employers are going to play a key role in the success of um, young workers and their skill development. So employment programs can work with potential employer partners to equip them to do this well. Uh, it might mean making sure that a workplace has mechanisms in place for really clear and consistent feedback for a young worker. Or again, we spoke with one program that actually offers that trauma-informed care training to employer partners so that employers can recognize trauma responses on the job and know how to respond to them effectively. Programs might also want to let employer partners know about job retention supports that they're offering young people in their program, whether that's something like assistance with transportation or ongoing job coaching, uh, because this can really support a young person's success at their company. Uh, so in some, it's really about striking a balancing act that meets the workforce need of employer partners, but also, again, takes into account those developmental and learning needs of young people. Um, again, on our website, we do have a toolkit that is full of resources about employer engagement and job development for people facing barriers to employment. Thank you. Thanks, Katie. Um, yeah, a lot of great information there. Again, if you have any questions for Katie or any other, please go ahead and um, send those our way in the, in the chat box. Um, and next we have Linda Kramer from Daybreak Dayton. So go ahead, Linda. Okay, hello everybody. Oh, that's a terrible picture. Uh, anyway, um, I'm with Daybreak in Dayton, Ohio. And uh, next slide, please. Uh, okay, great. Do I need to keep telling you what slide? Sorry. Um, yes. Okay. Um, we're in, Day uh, in Dayton, Ohio. We've been serving homeless youth since 1975. We actually opened as a runaway homeless youth provider. Um, and uh, since that time, we've evolved to um, have our basic shelter, which is shelter for uh, young people under the age of 18. We also now have a transition age youth shelter. We have two transitional housing programs, one which is a facility-based uh, program and one which is a scattered site. Um, and we also have our street outreach program. We're a mental health care provider. We're, we're certified by the state of Ohio to provide mental health services. And by next month, we'll also be an AOD provider, certified provider to do drug and alcohol treatment. Um, so, and we have now employment services, uh, which is what I'm going to focus on today. So why did we start um, our employment program? Uh, if you can, next slide, please, sorry. Next slide. 
our whole approach to employment or actually to serving our young people is person focused. And you can see in the middle, first, of course, is housing and basic needs. Um, and then to wrap around as many other services as possible, to, and not just to wrap around, but to really integrate them from social support, to mental health, AOD, employment, education, and then what other other supports that they need. Some of these, a lot of these we provide ourselves because we've evolved over the years to be able to do that. Others, we partner with other agencies in the community to do that. Uh, next slide, please. And we are totally uh, person-focused. So why did we start employment programming, which is fairly new to us, just a number of years? Uh, basically because we found our kids were very, very good at getting a job. They could hold it together for an interview. We could dress them up. We could teach them how to handshake. We could do test, into, you know, mock interviews with them. So they were very good at getting a job, but they were even better at getting fired from a job. Um, and we also found that uh, we, we found that they they had their own informal uh, job club that they'd come home from work they'd be out on our patio and we'd be hearing them talk about something horrible that happened at work and their friend would say oh you need to quit that job so they did <laughs> and we thought that's not quite the job club that we wanted to see them uh, be a part of next slide please. Um, one of the things that we found uh, in terms of a number of things that we found in terms of the most challenging employment barriers, we hear a lot about transportation, you know, those kinds of things. But really what we're finding is for our kids, it's the fact of one, they're adolescent to begin with. I mean, that, that in itself, it, you know, is challenging. Um, untreated mental illness, heavy substance use, lack of soft skills, anger issues, no high school diploma. Our last data showed us that of, of our youth ages 18 and above, 76% did not have a high school diploma or a GED. Um, and we were even shocked to see that high of a, of a number of a percentage. And going back to uh, what was mentioned before about the change theory, and many of them were not ready to change. They were in that pre-contemplative stage. Um, slide, please. So what do we do? We thought, we didn't really have anything in place. So we said, we'll start a social enterprise. It seemed a good idea at the time. It sounded sexy. So next slide, please. And so we started doing that by basically throwing spaghetti at the wall. And as you can see, most of that fell on our heads. We tried everything from plants and horticultural. We had a green roof. We tried something with that. We tried jewelry making. Um, we we tried a number of different things um, and then we came up with we realized that a lot of our kids actually like to help our shelter cook in uh, in the in the shelter kitchen so slide please so we decided to open up a dog treat bakery and it's called Lindy's Bakery it started as Lindy and Company you can see there the website um, and we've since rebranded as Lindy's Bakery but it is a dog treat bakery and we started it as a social enterprise we began it uh, the way we started it was that we happened to have we had an, an a vacant building, an old vacant, an old house vacant building, and we had a donor who was very interested in having us do something with that building. And literally, we went over, we met with the donor, and we said, "We have this idea about baking dog treats and dog treat bakery." And he said, uh, "Okay, uh, what do you th what do you need?" And I'll support it as long as you name it after my dog. And his dog's name was Lindy, so uh, you know I could be bought. I, I'll name it anything he wants. And this donor was the one who, who provided us with the startup money to, to open the bakery. We had no idea what we were doing. So the first year, we actually partnered with a local bakery. And um, they actually helped us develop our first recipes. And for the whole first year, we used their bakery, a human bakery, when they were closed to bake out treats. Next slide, please. So now we have our own bakery. We even have our own Lindy Mobile. Um, and in fact, we just built and, and moved into a new bakery. Um, but we actually hire our kids. They are paid at least minimum wage. We take our kids at any, you know, if they want in, we have no pre-requirements. They don't have to have gone through classes. If they want in, we will hire them. We started off by thinking, oh, we'll, you know, we'll set it up for 30, 40 hours a week. You know, they need to get this income. 
um, we found that our kids were not really able to maintain a 48, a 40 hour hour a week job. So typically we do about 20 hours a week for each kid. And typically they spend, they work in Lindy's anywhere from three months to six months. And it's all individualized depending on where they are uh, in their state of change and what they're looking to do and their skills. Um, so this is our social enterprise and our experiential. We have job coaches on the job. There's something like 15 strikes before they're out. And even when they're out, they can come back in. Uh, next slide, please. Um, people always ask us what are our challenges, successes. You know, it's social enterprise sounds really, really cool. Everybody thinks it's going to ge generate income for their agency or their program. Um, we have yet to find that it actually generates. We, you know, we we are. We do have revenue from sales, but the cost of running the social enterprise is much more than what we get in revenue. So. When you talk about a social enterprise, you need to be looking at that it's actually a double bottom line. You have your mission, um, and you need to blend your mission uh, with your business. Because you're, if you're getting out a product or a service, you need to produce. Um, and it was mentioned before about accepting failure. And that means accepting failure of both of the kids and letting them come back in. And also realizing that, again, the business may not be um, self-sustaining or generating income for your program or agency for quite some time. Um, some of the successes we've seen in 2016, we provided 76 youth with paid employment support and coaching on the job. Um, it, it has been a cost center for our agency, but we have found that it's also very attractive to funders. Um, you know, it's a great show and tell for those of you who are engaged in any kind of fundraising. Uh, so we have been able to maintain, support it, and even grow it. Uh, lessons learned in doing a social enterprise is what we found. We started by really selling our mission, and that worked fine in our own little local community because people knew who we were, knew about our agency, knew what we were trying to do. But if you're really trying to expand outside of your local area, as we were looking at selling a product, um, the product has to come first. So as we go out and we're doing national trade shows, you know, when you're talking, when we're talking to distributors, um, pet food distributors and buyers, they like the mission, but they want to know about the product first. Um, and basically, operating and open, opening and operating a social enterprise is a lot harder than it looks. I had no idea what we were getting into. Uh, it's been a fun ride, but it is, it is difficult work, and it's hit or miss as you go. Next slide, please. So the other pieces that we've done, in 2000, that we opened up our social enterprise in 2012, and in 2014, we were awarded a, a demonstration grant by SAMHSA, the um, uh, Administration for Mental Health and Addiction Services, um, and to to pilot uh, and be part of a demonstration program for IPS, which is Individual Placement and Support. And the whole concept between behind IPS is is very you can see it right on the slide. No one is excluded. It's rapid job placement. It's almost like housing first, but now it's employment first. Um, minimal pre work training, personalized job search. Uh, finding and understanding employees and long-term support and work. And the, the whole concept, and we've had um, technical assistance from the uh, Center of Evidence-Based Practices because this was a, a national or is, we're still in the midst of it. Uh, the whole theory is if, some, if a kid comes in and says, I want to work, I want a job, then we're not supposed to be putting them through any kind of assessments. We, you know, the, the the model says you find them a job. You help match them up to whatever their job um, aspirations are. Given our youth and given the amount of trauma, mental illness, cognitive delays, all of those things, I mean, what do you do when a kid comes in and says, you know, I, I want to be a superhero. That's what I want to be. Well, you need to be creative. We ended up finding him a job in a costume store where he can wear a superhero costume every day, and he was ecstatic. I mean, that was the best job in the world for him. I mean, so some of it is just trying to think outside of the box, 
of how, how do you do that? How do you find kids what they want to do? Because if we all think back to our first jobs, you know, or any jobs that we have, if we don't like the job, if we could talk about workforce development all we wa want and say, well, they're manufacturing jobs. That's what we, if, if you don't like the job or want that job, you're going you're gonna to sabotage it and, and you won't keep it. You won't maintain it. So part of that is really trying to find the best match for the youth. I mean, again, think of when, if you're on this call, if, for those of you who went to college, you know, how many majors did you have during this age frame? How many, you, you know, did you switch majors three or four times over the course of three or four years? It's part of adolescence development and career exploration. So I think we also have to think in terms of employment services for kids. It's not just about getting a job or even maintaining a job. It also has to include that exploration uh, stage of trying out different jobs and seeing what what matches the best. Next slide, please. Uh, as we continue to grow our employment program, um, we found also that our kids, as I mentioned, they don't have a high school or, or um, GED diploma. Um, they, a lot of them had legal histories that kept them from getting employed, a lot of substance abuse issues. And so we created, we we embarked on a whole project called Project Rescue. It was a big fundraising campaign. And we actually, part of that campaign included the building of Oz. Oz is, is stands for Opportunity Zone. This building uh, we did is, not, is right next door to our main building we, where we have our shelter outreach center and some, some of our housing programs. And this center is, is strictly a, a education and employment center for, for homeless and opportunity youth. And as we like to say, all you need is brains, heart, courage, and persistence, um, and, and you're it. Next slide, please. So what we also found when we, when we started Oz and we opened Oz, the sum of the parts is greater. You know, we all hear this. The sum of the parts is greater than the whole. So in Oz now, which is our employment and education staff, we have our employment staff, which is now uh, 10 FTEs. We have our Lindy's Bakery staff, which are eight FTEs. And we also now partnered with Youth Build, our local Youth Build program. They were actually finding themselves being kicked out of where they were previously located. So they were becoming homeless, and we had extra space in our building. So they are now in our building, co-located with us. And they are, we, they actually provide GED education and certificate programs. They provide high school, they help the kids actually high school education diploma uh, work. And while they're in the youth build program, the kids also can earn an, a trade, a trade certificate. So our local youth build program offers both uh, uh, certifications in construction. They, the kids actually, um, build it or re remodel a house uh, in the community and they, they earn their credentials like OSHA and some other trades um, trade certificates and they also have a, a allied health field component where kids can earn their certificates and, and earn STNA certificates, phlebotomy, um, medical terminology. We built out a classroom for them. They have a they, we put the construction lab in our basement and the, the whole idea about creating this sum of the parts is that an Oz kid is an Oz kid. We don't call them, oh, you're a youth build or you're a daybreak kid. We're actually blending all of our services and all of our staffs. And it's a culture, put, you know, it's, it's, it's hard sometimes, but we're blending all of that um, so that when any youth that comes into the Oz facility, um, we all own every youth there. And we are all working toward the same game plan in terms of education and employment. The other thing with education we have to remember is that, um, you know, some kids have to decide between if, if they're homeless, they still need to um, earn money to pay their rent. So we're actually now paying kids to earn their educational um, credentials. So they actually get paid for moving up a grade level or getting more credits or earning a credential. And just like many of us might have told our own children or been told as children, school is your job, we're, we're letting it be known that school can be your job as well. Next slide, please. 
so as we put this whole thing together, you can see this is kind of where we are on a collaborative and how things fall, you know, all different programs can refer youth into the Oz employment um, program. So they can, kids can come from other community programs, from our county job center, from daybreak programs, from uh, Youth Build Itself, from any of the daybreak programs, and together they all work together. To, so Oz provides all of the employment and education support services for all the kids that are coming to it from any of these sources. Slide, please. Most recently, we were just awarded, I guess the hot new topic, um, in our community anyway, is collective impact. So our county and our United Way got together and they said they were only going to fund programs that were uh, collective impact models. And one of their areas they wanted to see something come in under, under uh, collective impact was stable employment. So we um, connected with seven other agencies, you can see them on the slide, and together we put in uh, an application for funding. And it was, it was funded, so we're just getting started. But the whole goal of this was we have a shared, a shared vision, shared goals and measurements, and shared best practice approaches. So even if the other agencies might be serving adults or whatever, we still use the IPS approach. We, we're not trying to hold people to fidelity. Uh, that's a whole different level. But the approach is anybody who wants to work, um, should be working, we should be helping them getting a job, and that um, it's, it's client choice. Uh, the other thing is uh, we also overlay on top of that the whole change theory. So part of our data collection and all is really kind of assessing where are they in that phases of change? Are they pre-contemplative? Are they contemplative? You know, where are they in that? And that will help to direct our staffs in all of these agencies of what's potentially the best intervention depending on where they are in the change theory, what practices work best to get them engaged. Next please. Uh, so these are the outcomes that we will be tracking and have been um, and you can see them on this um, on the slide and when we talk about employment, we also, as I said, talk about high school diploma and GEDs and credentialings because those are all parts of employment. We don't want to get our kids stuck in a minimum wage job for the rest of their lives. Um, so we want to be able to provide them with the skills um, and resources that they can continue to grow in their employment plans way after they leave daybreak or any of our services. Next, please. A lot of people will, when they come and they do it, we have people coming all the time now and we want to see what you're doing and it's like, oh, we want to do this, we want to. Remember, for those of you that are just starting out, this, this is an evolution in and of itself. We just didn't, you know, in one year create what we're doing. And we're still learning, we're still creating and evolving. So you can see we actually started our employment programming with a part-time employment specialist. That was all we had. And it became so impactful and I can tell you, once we started really working with employment, in all the other services that we've done, and I've been with Daybreak now 20 years, which is hard to believe, but I could say that this is probably, this has been probably the most impactful interventions that I've seen in my time with Daybreak in terms of moving kids out of homelessness um, and into self-sufficiency. Um, and, and it's, and you know, it's a, also, to be honest, it's a great sell to the community. The, the business partners love it, the community loves it, because again, it's not, you know, the proverbial thing, it's not a handout, it's a hand up. And we're actually help, helping kids to move out of, out of homelessness by becoming self-sufficient, having the opportunity to do that. Next, please. So thanks for listening, and next. And these are just some resources. I mentioned the IPS model, Individual Placement and Support. Um, Redis is a great resource for anybody interested in social enterprises and transitional jobs. And also with transitional jobs, obviously Heartland, who's uh, sponsoring this, this webinar. So thank you all very much. Thank you so much. And we have one more um, 
presenter, Gabrielle from New Moms and Bright Endeavor. Um, take it away, guys. Hi, uh, hoping everyone can hear me okay. Um, I'm Gabrielle Carroll McNeil from New Moms Bright Endeavors. Uh, New Moms is the job training agency, and Bright Endeavors is the social enterprise that we use for that transitional jobs um, placement that we do for our young moms um, here at Bright Endeavors. And there you can see a sampling of um, some of our uh, one of our candles. Next slide. So we are, like I mentioned, a social enterprise located in Chicago, and we provide transformative workforce tools to moms um, making and manufacturing soy candles. Um, next slide, please. And um, our mission, in short, is to interrupt the generational cycle of poverty and create strong families through this model of um, transitional jobs training, um, which is a blended approach of hands-on work experience at the candle making company, um, as as well as the hands-on um, or the classroom portion um, that we have, which is um, at this point 16 weeks. Um, next slide, please. Um, here's our model. Um, we just um, actually came out with a new branding um, just to really explain thoroughly what New Moms is all about. So we have three core components, housing, job training, and family support. Again, just interrupting that cycle, um, indicative of the breaks there where you see the gray um, of poverty in the Chicagoland area. Um, and our job training program is kind of the red, vibrant part of that. Um, that's not what they say when you listen to them, but that's just what I say when I'm talking to people. Next slide. <laughs> So, um, again, we serve uh, moms who are able to work according to state standards, which uh, the youngest would be 16 all the way through 24. Um, and the last uh, fiscal year, we served over 100 moms, 123 to be exact. And so these are just some of the statistics that um, almost half of our moms are homeless or unstably housed. So it's a nice match um, with the housing program that we have here. Uh, most of our moms have a high school diploma or GED, and those that do not, we really work with them um, to make sure that they achieve that standard, especially if that is um, you know, in line with their career goals, which you know, is hard to, to do anything um, work-wise if you do not have at least a high school diploma or GED. Um, most of our moms live in extreme poverty according to those poverty rates of Illinois, and most of our moms, over 70%, are survivors of interpersonal abuse, which would include domestic violence or sexual assault. Uh, next slide. Um, so our outreach team um, screens for the age appropriateness um, and to see if our moms are parents or are uh, pregnant. Um, we do um, require that they live in Chicago proper, so um, the outside uh, uh, surrounding suburbs are not eligible, um, unfortunately. Um, so but we're just screening just for those basic things. Um, we do have orientations um, every month, and those are held um, two weeks before a new cohort begins, just to give them a little slack um, to secure child care or um, do any other planning that they need to make sure that they can start um, work on time. We do employ some motivational interviewing techniques uh, to connect with our moms, um, just to get them excited about the upcoming program and to try to help navigate any potential barriers before they actually come into our doors. Um, to start the program. Uh, next slide. So just a quick overview. Um, it is a 16-week program, again, that blended classroom and hands-on training um, on the floor. Um, we have about eight cohorts a year. Um, they do overlap at some point. So at uh, any given time, there could be two to three uh, cohorts overlapping each other. Um, they do get paid $11 an hour, which is the minimum wage for Chicago, and um, the but the first week is mainly like our intake orientation week. So we do not pay them for that first week of class. It would start the second week, but they can make up to $3,762 um, in wages, which is um, really allowing for a slack for our participants. Um, we do provide them with transportation as well in the form of bus pa passes or gas cards, depending on their uh, mode of transportation. Um, we provide them with interviews, um, I'm sorry, not with interviews, with uniforms um, and an interview outfit. And we do have rep response incentives um, to help them complete their goals. And this is called our fishbowl. And our fishbowl, um, 
is in line with our Earn and Learn program um, in which we give our participants punch cards, if you will, and they can earn um, punches for um, things like um, completing their TAID test or um, filling out a FAFSA application, um, attending a job fair, um, submitting paycheck stubs, even parent child activities, because we do have parenting support groups um, just to support young moms, um, and they can, you know, talk to each other about some of the barriers that they've been facing. And they always have some um, some good advice for each other about ways and, and resources that they found um, and things of that nature. And so we give them um, uh, signatures or punches for the things that they're earning throughout the week, and then they can redeem those for some prizes, gift cards. Um, and we call them um, new mom's kits. So if they need a kit for their bathroom, it would come with um, paper towels, toilet tissue, uh, and hand soap, for example, um, or laundry kit, like a roll of quarters, um, some dryer sheets, and some laundry detergent if they needed to do laundry that week. So things like that that really just keeps them excited about coming and excited about um, earning some of those additional things that they can redeem at the end of every week. Uh, next slide, please. So our program design is for our opportunity youth, is what we love to call them. We do use motivational interviewing um, and executive skills coaching within a trauma-informed network uh, that uh, Caitlin spoke to earlier. Um, and executive skills um, is simply a way that we organize, react, or do. Um, at work. And so we talk to them a lot about their executive skills, um, how they, you know, their time management, their flexibility, um, their sustained attention. So we use all these terms with them to really help propel them uh, forward to meet their goals um, and to meet the goals on the sales floor. Um, we try to align our program schedule with the child care needs. So our program schedule is from 9.30 to 3. So that allows, you know, for them to be able to um, drop their children off at daycare and make sure that they're picking them up on time, especially if they're coming from um, a different area of the city. They may, uh, some of our moms um, travel up to one and a half to two hours to get here. So um, we want to make sure that we're giving um, allowing for that. We also have half-day Fridays to allow for slack because we know that young moms have tons of appointments. They have WIC appointments, and uh, they have to go see their caseworker um, for their SNAP benefits and all types of things of that nature, uh, doctor's appointments. So we want to make sure that we're giving slack for that. Um, we do a quarterly milestone celebration. So when they complete the program, um, when they earn uh, a GED or um, when they go back to school, um, we have these quarterly celebrations that we can really just uh, take a step back and, and celebrate um, their accomplishments. Um, even the jobs, right? I, I got a job for 30 days or 90 days, so those benchmarks as well. Um, we do think that it's important to pay them for the program time in class as well as on the BE floor, um, providing them with all those uh, incentives um, and pay for their work, um, really equalizing the playing field that what you do in class is just as important as what you do on the floor. And we follow our moms uh, up to two years, um, including, um, and they are eligible for incentives and re employment retention uh, bonuses as well. Uh, next slide, please. So this is just the phases that um, that that they go through here at Bright Endeavors. So the coaching, mentorship, and retention is something that follows them throughout their program time. Um, but as classroom, then Bright Endeavors, then kind of the emphasis on job placement and retention. But we really focus on training during um, those, I'll say, weeks one through Eight, and then we get real intense with the job, plan, um, job placement piece. Next slide, please. So this is just a synopsis of how it all was included and kind of how things flow. Um, there's 130 hours of classroom training modules, much more intensive in the first eight weeks because the last eight weeks is really when we focus on that placement. So we do career interest assessments, and that way we can start 
goal setting around what those are, um, building their portfolios, um, having them do some soft skills training, um, helping them with their basic computer skills, and also deciding if they're going to um, qualify for um, an ITA, we can help prepare them for that as well. Um, we do contextualized literacy and numeracy modules, and we base that off the Heartline, um, Heartland's Urban Farm curriculum, and we do that with them on the training floor. Uh, we do parenting workshops, as I mentioned, um, and talking about executive skills, um, and there are opportunities for them to test for these stackable credentials um, and certificates um, that can really help them um, once they graduate from our program. They are paired with and work with a, um, I call them a, a empowerment coach, but that's the official title, Supportive Employment Coach, um, from day one um, as well. Next slide. On the floor, um, it's almost double of those hours. They get paid and work on the floor up to 235 hours. Um, and that way they can get kind of that immediate on the job feedback um, while working with their coach. They do have a, a coach on the floor that helps them with some of those production goals and coaching them around uh, smart goals and executive skills and um, really talking to them about leadership, ownership, and teamwork on the floor. Next slide. You'll see um, a picture of some of our lovely team members there. Um, they'll spend two sessions a week with our job developers, starting with week nine. And if um, they graduate without permanent employment, then they can attend our ongoing U job, kind of like YouTube U job. I know, super cute. Um, but they work with their um, the uh, job developer at that point much more um, intensely, um, and we do that every single week, um, and that um, includes attending job fairs and career outings. Um, we do have corporate and volunteer groups come in and do career innings with them, um, helping with mock interviews and things of that nature. Um, but the job developer at the same time is developing employee partnerships outside the building and taking them on career outings as well. We do have open lab, like kind of drop-in sessions after work if they want to come and do applications and things of that nature. And uh, we ensure that we do this ongoing retention uh, around coaching referrals. Um, and we're in the process of developing an alumni network. Uh, next slide. Uh, some of our results here. Um, We've had 40 permanent um, placements this year. That is the average wage um, at this point. Um, more than 50% of our moms have retained employment for at least a year. The state average uh, is 34%. Um, and we're really empowering our adolescent mothers um, to, to um, make more money, economic independence, um, financial literacy. Um, and so we have shown an increase of 4.1 times um, the average of the state of Illinois. Uh, so next slide. I'm pretty much here at the end. Um, I want to thank you for listening, and I think we'll just move on to any questions. But if you want to know more about um, Bright Endeavors and our candles, they smell lovely, um, and they are, we're really proud of this product. It's really empowering for our moms to see that they are making something of value, and people will pay a pretty penny for it. So there's just a lot of value um, in that, and they do sign each and every candle on the bottom. Um, but yeah, if you ever have a, um, I want to know more, please go to brightendeavors.org or newmoms.org, and you can actually purchase our candles through there as well. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you, Gabrielle and, um, and to Linda for sharing such um, great examples of how to put some of these practices um, into practice. <laughs> so now we're going to move on to just a brief um, opportunity to answer some of the questions that our listeners had. Um, first, I just want to start off uh, with Linda and Gabrielle. If you just want to share one, I know that there are are so many amazing things that you you talked about, but if you had like one um, aspect or um, tip for folks um, implementing employment services um, with these young folks, what would you say, what would you want to highlight? That question makes sense. Oh my. <laughs> and, sorry, that was too big. <laughs> it doesn't have to be Pearls of wisdom, right? <laughs> yeah. um, really. 
mine you know, would just be don't don't give up. I'm sorry. Don't give up on the no. kids. I mean, they, they're going to mess up. They're going to frustrate you. Um, they're going to all of a sudden disappear, go out and find them. Um, and, you know, sometimes it just takes over and over again until the light bulb goes off in, in their own lives, in their own head that they're, they're ready to move it forward. Um, and, and they, they do and they can, which is just hang in there. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, that's, that's tough to follow. Um, but I think I will say give slack where you can um, because I feel that, so here's an example. At Bright Endeavors, our moms um, at, at one point were assigned aprons to wear for work, but then they had to wear dark pants and like a black T-shirt or something like that. Well, we got a lot of, you know, coming in with your bright orange T-shirt or coming in with your cute top, and, you know, with the slashes in the back, right? So instead of having these back and forth all the time, we're like, you know what? Let's just give them uniforms, right? Wear this, <laughs> right? Take, you right. know, when I'm a young mom and I'm trying to get out the house, you know what I'm saying? Like and having to decide what to wear, make it easy for them when possible, Right. So just help with that slack. Um, we found that we got a lot of absenteeism here and there. And like, you know what, let's build in a half a day on Fridays. Right. That way they know in advance they can take that day and do whatever they need to do. And it's cut the ab um, absenteeism down tremendously. Right. So it, it just helps everybody. Plus, it you know, allows the staff a half a day, you know, to just catch up on notes and things of that nature. So where it makes sense, just build it in and, and make it easy for them because, as you said, it, they're young. They're going to mess up. So let's just, you know, help cut the corners where, you know, some of these rules just don't make sense. <laughs> That's those great tips, both, both of you. I, I love that. Um, then let's just do maybe one last one um, for Mindy. Um, Mindy, are there any examples of communities that you know of that are leading the way on developing a systemic response to homelessness that that includes those connections to the employment system, or or anyone can answer? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I will. Uh, I think Megan also probably has a couple of ideas about this too, especially with her work on the 100 Day Challenges. But, um, you know, one of the big rock stars uh, who are leading us um, across the country on, on doing just this kind of systemic approach, um, combining the homelessness and housing systems with the employment system is Houston, Texas. Um, of course, we all know recently uh, uh, the with the hurricane, Houston is, um, has some more immediate concerns, but their homelessness system and the crisis response system um, has integrated the workforce system to such an extent that um, workforce uh, workers are co-located at coordinated entry access points. So um, they also use um, something that Linda talked about was employment first. Um, that is an awesome concept that I also love. Um, and they call it income now because some folks will, you know, not be able to, uh, to do employment and will instead have to be assessed for uh, things like SSI or Social Security um, uh, disability. So what they do is just as you, the first minute you touch the homelessness, system you're also you're being assessed for your housing needs your crisis needs but then also what are your employment needs what are your income needs what can we connect you to right now so making that an equal part of the crisis response and having that system at the table as an equal partner and they're getting tremendous results from it um, Megan any other ideas about um, some of the cool stuff happening with employment in the 100-day challenge communities you know, I would give a shout out to Hennepin County again. Hennepin County is a leader on addressing youth homelessness. Uh, they're an incredible, incredible direct service staff team out there across the county uh, and just lovely folks to work with. And they're looking at how we uh, connect young people, not even to employment programs, but to actual jobs in the community with actual employers where there is a possibility for advancement. I would add to um, that, you know, something one of the presenters said earlier in the call about the importance of relationship. And I want to normalize that for a minute. Every single professional job I have ever had came as a result of some person I knew. And I think that it's, you could look at your experience and, and see the same thing. So young people experiencing homelessness are no different. Uh, it is often how the employment system works. So um, 
I think that we can normalize that for young people as well and say, we're here to support you in making that connection to an employer where you can advance and get your needs met. I think that's a great point and something um, that we can think about at the program level, but also at the continuum of care level in our, in our communities is um, thinking about who's on your board. Um, board members can often be great connections for connect for getting young people um, into job opportunities. Like um, I agree with Megan, every job that I've got since I um, <laughs> since I moved out of my previous life into one that actually um, focuses on employment um, has been because I had networking connections with some folks who cared about me and who thought well of me and who could vouch for me um, with an employer who maybe didn't know me. Um, and, and to the extent that we can access the folks who have connections that we're already connected to, like board members, I think that's another great way to kind of work that systemic approach in at a personal level. And, and I'd like to add to that, but in doing that, I think it's really, really important and uh, to, to really do some education. It was said earlier in the webinar, do some education with, because you're going to get employers that are going to say, oh, yes, oh, that, that's great. I want to help. I want to help. Um, but you really need to educate them in terms of what potentially to expect, um, because you don't want to burn the employers, and you don't want to burn the youth, and you don't want to burn your agency's reputation. So there's got to be yeah. some education going on with the employers ahead of time to, so they know what to expect. And then before you fire them, you know, call us and we'll come out, you know, <laughs> and there's all kinds of other interventions that we can do in the meantime. Yeah. Linda, I, as you were as you were saying all that, I'm constantly struck by the parallels between uh, rapid rehousing landlord engagement best practices and right. employment mm -hmm. first best practices on employer engagement. There's just so much of that. It's all relationship building, right? Right. Mm -hmm. okay. Absolutely. Awesome. Great. What a what a good discussion. Um, uh, let's see. I want to ask one. We've had a few questions related to um, change theory that Katie talked about. Um, so I'll just toss it over to Katie to talk a little bit about um, those stages of change and what talk a little bit more about the recycling and um, in particular, someone wanted to know a little bit about evidence gathered that some folks are not ready to change. So. Great. Thanks so much. Um, this is Katie. And of course, I would also welcome anyone else who has expertise on this to weigh in as well. Um, so I've seen some of the questions come in. Again, one was about um, how do you know if someone is not ready to change? Uh, so I would suggest that for anyone who is interested in change theory to go ahead and read an article um, that I actually read in graduate school and that I've gone back to a number of different times, uh, which is called Why Don't Continents move, why don't people change? Um, and I think that as is inherent in that title is that continents do move. Um, they just move really, really slowly. Um, and so that is the same uh, with people. And I think that um, we probably all have examples that we can draw from in our personal lives of uh, when it's taken us a while to establish um, a new habit in our lives or to really make uh, tangible uh, changes towards a big goal. So I think that that's a really useful piece um, to think about uh, what it means to be ready to change and what it means to not necessarily be at that point yet. Um, another question was just about that recycling. So Really, the concept there, um, kind of across change theory, again, is that change is not necessarily a linear process. Um, most of us don't go from uh, waking up one morning and deciding, uh, to use an example, um, you know, I'm going to go to the gym today and then I'm going to go to the gym every morning for the rest of my life. Um, so, it, it's really this idea that we might get an idea, that it might kind of fade out of our minds. Uh, we might take a few initial steps uh, towards that goal, um, but not necessarily be fully committed to it. 
um, and kind of slide back and forth between, um, you know, are we thinking about this idea? Are we getting up and doing it every day? Um, and to just think about change as not something that happens overnight. Um, open to other thoughts that folks might have. Hey, it's Mindy. I don't have um, the stats right in front of me, um, but uh, on a personal level, as someone who's been in recovery for a while, um, I, I, it may be that people who are interested in getting clean and sober, and I think we also need to point out maybe some folks, maybe that's not their goal and we need to be okay with that, um, but folks who are interested in getting clean and sober, it usually takes uh, somewhere between four and seven times, maybe one of you know the exact stat, um, and and that's okay. That's how humans work. We don't get things um, exactly right the first time. Um, also, uh, when people are involved in uh, violent relationships, we know that it also takes several attempts at leaving before the leaving finally sticks, even in nonviolent relationships. For any of you who have been in not ideal relationships, um, and you leave and you go back um, and not even that it's abusive just that you're not uh, especially happy and it might be a little dysfunctional um, so I think uh, expecting um, young people or any folks who are experiencing homelessness and have a really immediate crisis of basic needs like shelter and food um, to not uh, to to want to bam just change everything and get it right the first time is is unrealistic um, and also just kind of disrespectful of of them and um, and who they are as human beings they're just like everybody else. Great, thanks. Um, well, I think we will probably go ahead and wrap up. I know there are a few questions um, that we didn't get to, um, and I will collect those and try and get them answered offline um, in follow-up in follow emails after the webinar. Um, I just have a few um, finishing slides before we end today. Um, so just, again, a reminder that the, the, all the slides from the presentation and the recording of the webinar will be available on our website, and you should get an email, I think, with links to both. Um, and again, like I said, we'll try and get any unanswered questions out to you. Um, I, I'm getting some questions around some of the resources related to change theory, and I'll try and include those in a follow-up email as well. Um, lastly, just a reminder that on the Heartland Alliance National Initiative's website, there are a lot of awesome free resources, including some of the toolkits that you heard Katie talk about um, and plenty of other ones that might be of interest to, interest to you. Um, also, we're going to be hosting webinars um, about once a month-ish um, on a range of topics related to um, employment as a tool for preventing and ending homelessness. So um, check out some of those. And lastly, um, just another big thank you to all of our great speakers um, for taking time to share with all of us your knowledge and lessons learned. Um, I encourage our listeners to reach out and connect if you want more info. Um, and finally, just want to end by giving a shout out to everybody who joined the webinar today for all the work you do on behalf of these amazing young people. Thanks, everyone, and have a great day.